Is this an economy, a U.S. economy, that needs Fed cuts? What's your take on a global scale? You know, it's starting to feel like the economy is uh, gaining a little bit of strength at the beginning of the year. It's not, it's not robust. Maybe a little bit early to tell if this is a, a long-term trend, but it's been a decent start to the year. Electronics has been uh, a bit stronger than last year. Last year was a kind of a weak spot, mm -hmm. so our outlook is good. Automotive had a good year last year, and I think despite the discussion around electric vehicles and some of the flat to negative sentiment that's in the news, the reality is I think it's going to be another good year uh, in the automotive sector. Mm -hmm. Housing's been the slow start, but there's been an uptick in single-family home uh, starts, which is good. Uh, that usually has a ripple effect through a lot of other durable goods manufacturing. We haven't seen that yet. so. Uh, a modest good start to the year and we just see how things develop. So we're getting there. So we're getting th there. that begs the question that if we do say get two to three cuts this year, for example, from the Fed, um, is your expectation that we see accelerated growth, higher inflation? Like does that actually start more growth? Well, I think in the commodity space and in our industry mm -hmm. in particular, we tend to lead into a slowdown. And so we started to lead into this 18 months, uh, middle of this year will be 24 months ago. And we typically tend to lead out. And so it's too early to say we're coming out, but you can start to see shoots that are like when we see a recovery. And of course, that demand, you know, what's missing from the economy r right now is the durable goods demand mm -hmm. and, when that, and construction demand. And when that comes back, those are high volume applications and that demand pull is going to mean that prices are going to move up a bit. I don't know if I would call that necessarily inflationary, mm -hmm. but that's just the cycle. What do you think it's waiting for? I think it's waiting for rate reductions for okay. the mortgage rates to come down. Uh, I think that's the next big thing that typically triggers a, a kind of a shoot up in the housing market. And then that triggers a lot of other services and durable goods demand that comes behind it. So we may see a second half recovery. I'm that's hopeful. That's sort of what I'm hearing from I'm, you. That I'm that hopeful, could... yeah. Is it a similar picture um, over in Europe? So. The chemical sector in Europe is under a lot of pressure. I mean, input costs are high. The economy there is, is weaker in many sense compared to the U.S. W what's your take? European consumer demand is not uh, nearly as strong as it is uh, here in the States. And of course, the, the weight of uh, higher energy costs has hit the consumer in a lot of different ways. Um, now, we're seeing an improvement year over year. Obviously, energy's come down, but Natural gas is below $10 a million BTU landed in Europe, but we sit here today at $1.60. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe the long-term trend is 250 to 350 Yeah, but still, that's a difference. Still a big difference. And electricity, you know, which most consumers purchase, electricity costs are double, uh, maybe a little bit more than what they are here in the U.S. So I think, you know, there's a big question. When I look at my downstream customers in Europe, I'm always questioning how long will they be there. And if you don't have a domestic market to service in Europe, you, you really can't afford to export from Europe. So if you don't have a domestic market to service, you have to say, you know, what does my footprint need to be? How long can I be there in order to be part of that economy? That's a big deal. I mean, that, you're talking about the automotive industry, construction industry. Like, is that going to move? What, yeah. What's your best sense? A lot of big, a lot of technology comes out of there too. I mean, beyond just the industry, a lot of the technology that we use around the world starts in Europe. And so, you know, exporting technology obviously is a little bit easier than exporting product. But uh, we're already starting to see imports of electric vehicles from China into Europe. We're seeing uh, China has become a lower cost competitor than Europe in petrochemicals, so you're starting to see product move into Europe. The Middle East obviously has been a big supplier mm -hmm. uh, because of their cost position into Europe. Europe's getting a bit of a reprieve right now because of the Suez Canal situation, so operating rates are up a little bit. But I think that once that Israel-Gaza conflict is resolved, then we'll see things go back to normal. Is it fair to say that you wouldn't build a new chemical plant in Europe right now? <laughs> be very tough. You'd have to be in a very specialized downstream market that you knew could handle the higher mm -hmm. input costs. But I would say in general, it would be very tough. So for you then, let's take a look at inflation for a second. Where are costs still rising and where are they falling? You're starting to see um, some costs, I mean, cost in commodities came off pretty dramatically. I think uh, one of the reasons we announced our 
final investment decision on our project in Canada at the end of last year was because we were able to lock in a lot of bulk material costs like uh, steel, um, concrete, cement, all the things we need to build the plant. Um, so I think that's been good. Now, obviously, as some of this construction demand and things come back, that'll, that'll tend to rise with the cycle. But I think if you looked at the commodity portion, a lot of inflation came out of there. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the consumer, like going to the grocery store, some of that hasn't come out yet. And so I think we're starting to see that with the destocking that happened last year, no signs of really restocking uh, in the value chain. I think you're going to start to see some of that consumer inflation come out too. And I think that's a little bit what the Fed's looking at. Are you worried about tariffs come, I don't know, November, <laughs> January? From well, either president. <laughs> I, yeah, I, you make a great point. Both tariffs. Um, as a global company mm -hmm. and, and as a company that has been part of global trade for many, many years, tariffs don't stimulate demand anywhere. So I, I think what would happen under a tariff regime is we might not be happy with the demand result. Global free trade has been a better platform for growth. It's been better for growth not just for the U.S., and we're advantaged, of course, because of energy, among other things, but it's been great for other countries. It's lifted so many people out of poverty. It's created a middle class. It's allowed technology to trans transfer around the world. So it would I, also I, just mean that you would have to produce and use the products in, in country, right? You have to produce and do in country. It would be totally separate from each other. Right. It, when we have a supply chain today that is not U.S. centric mm -hmm. and hasn't had time to reshore, so that would become inflationary in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the thing we're trying to fight and the tool we're using, they both could end up being <laughs> inflationary. I don't, I don't know that tariffs is the answer. Let's turn to if you're building a new plant today, what are you going to power it with <laughs> in the next 10 to 15 years? Like, what's going to be that thing? Well, we're, we are building a new plant in Canada, mm -hmm. and um, the purpose for going up there was to build the world's first zero scope one and two emissions ethylene complex. Um, we will power it with hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, we have, it's a pretty elegant solution because we actually take ethane, a natural gas liquid, we crack it to make ethylene, and we make two byproducts, methane and hydrogen. Lindy will come in and build an autothermal reformer that will convert that to pure hydrogen, and that pure hydrogen will fire the furnace. So it's a very closed-loop system mm -hmm. um, that will allow us to capture all the CO2 off the autothermal reformer and sequester that and make zero, scope one and two, ethylene and plastics there. Uh, it'll be the biggest hydrogen carbon capture project of its kind uh, in the world. And it'll be the first one. First phase will be up in 2027. One more quick question on that. Yeah. When are you going to make money off of it? And that's my way of understanding how expensive up. is it to, to put together. As soon as we start it up. It'll be uh, as competitive as our project that we did here in Texas and started up in 2017. You know, Canada has got a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we're able to recover some of the higher costs of scrubbing out the CO2 from the price on carbon. And the Alberta government and the federal government in Canada have investment tax credits and incentives for us to put in the hydrogen technology in the first place. So both of those things mean we'll be able to make a return like the project we built down here in Texas. Hmm. And I think if you look at what we did with IRA, we, we also made a big step forward. One with the tax credits and, and the support for new technologies. But I think more importantly, the breadth of the IRA. So we, as opposed to say the EU, which is very focused on a transition, but very specific, you can only make green hydrogen a certain way. We said, look, um, all forms of low carbon energy are part of the equation, and we're gonna make it accessible for everybody to be part of the equation. So that could be small modular nuclear, mm -hmm which we've signed up to with the DOE and the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program with X Energy. Mm -hmm. We're looking at one of our sites here in Texas, Sea uh, Drift near Victoria, Texas. And we're looking at that site to basically replace all of our combined cycle gas cogen with a small modular reactor for 80 megawatt units mm -hmm. that would take all the power and steam at the site to zero carbon. Wow. 
That's, that's a, a big project, yeah. but we think we can do that and help X Energy bring that cost competitive with hydrogen carbon capture or combined cycle gas with CO2 scrubbing. Uh, we think we can be competitive with both of those.